Good day. Uh, today we are going to talk to Dr. Faye Kukonazi, a senior lecturer, a researcher in the Center of Development Support. Welcome, Doctor. Thank you very much for having me. Good. Doctor, can you share with us how did you become a researcher? Um, I think for me, becoming a researcher is um, something that was kind of a natural progression. I was very um, curious about the experiences of young people in their attempt to get into higher education. And this was drawing from my own personal experiences as a young person trying to get to university. So once I got to university and then I started hearing and interacting more about with young people, I started to see that there's certainly um, synergies in terms of experiences and I started thinking about what are the things that I could do or contribute towards in terms of addressing the challenges that other young people are facing. So I guess it was out of that experience that I got curious and then out of that curiosity that I then invested my energy in learning more and researching around higher education issues. Thank you so much. And then, Doctor, what are you currently working on? Uh, a lot of things, I should say. <laughs> a lot of things. But I think I guess I'll speak to the key projects that I'm working on. So I've got three projects that I'm busy with at the moment. The first one is the Tutuga project. And I'm looking at the experiences of international students um, in accessing e-learning uh, during COVID. And then I've got another project that I'm working on that's funded by the AIHRC in the UK. It's on um, storing the discourses of inclusion and exclusion in the UK, Nigeria, and in South Africa. So what we're doing in the project is we're trying to find out how teachers and learners conceptualize and think about inclusion and exclusion in these three different contexts. And then I've got the final one, which is funded by the EMS. Uh, the faculty here, which is my faculty, <laughs> and it also it looks at um, University of Pretoria, the University of the Free State, uh, Union Zulu, and University of Limpopo, and we're trying to see how international uh, African international students actually experience uh, e-learning as well. Oh, thank you so much. Mm. And then, Doctor, coming to e-learning. Mm -hmm. I think we were more talking of technology. Right. So what role is technology playing in this field of uh, support? Mm. I think um, in as much as uh, I for one still like the traditional ways of communicating and learning because I think there, is, there are personal relationships and engagement that are formed in the process. But I think without a doubt, we can't shy away from the fact that e-learning and technology as a whole is taking over the way we know things to be, the way we know education to be, the way we know learning to be. And I certainly see that in the next um, five to 10 years, most of us or most of our students will certainly be uh, learning through the, the technology stuff, right? And that's also, I guess, an area of interest of mine in terms of thinking about internationalization of higher education, right? So we think about international students. Will we, in the next 10, 15 years, be having international students from other African countries or from uh, elsewhere physically present in our institutions? I, I, I doubt it will be the case. I think we will be having international students, but they're going to be accessing uh, resources and teaching material and lecturers through um, okay. technology. So certainly uh, you know, technology is taking us places, it's definitely shifting things. And although most of us are not necessarily ready for it, it's certainly something that's going to happen. Thank you so much, Doctor. And then are there any exciting gaps within your field of study? I think um, there are exciting gaps in my field of study, but I, I guess I, I, if I can, I can just categorize them into three. I think empirically in terms of the the work, the on the ground work that still needs to be done. I think there's a lot that's been done in my field. I think we, we know what are the challenges that young people face uh, in terms of accessing higher education. 
we know a lot around uh, I work on migration as well we know a lot in terms of uh, what migrants here in this country experience in terms of accessing higher education we, we know a lot of things about what the problems are and I guess for me the gap is in terms of finding the solutions and working towards applying those solutions I, I think um, research needs to redirect um, its focus and resources in terms of trying to, you know, duplicating projects and work that has been done, but shifting now to coming up with programs and interventions to address the problems that have already been identified. I, I, I think that's the gap, that's the key gap when it comes to empirical work. And then when it comes to um, theory, I certainly think, and for me this is the, the I, I love it because it's intellectually challenging, I think certainly there's a lot that can be done in terms of bringing different ideologies, different philosophies, um, different um, theories together. For example, I, I work with Amatya Sen, who, is, uh, who, who works with capability approach. But also beyond that, I think about how other approaches could actually speak to the approach that I use. For example, you could use Amatya Sen, who is an optimist, uh, with Boudoir, who's a pessimist. So for me, they, there's a gap there that exists, which I guess most researchers might not necessarily notice, but there's something that could be done in terms of coming up or rethinking what theory looks like and how we can bring different theories to speak to each other. And that would make a very good intellectual contribution, I think. And I think the third one, I say three, right? I think the third one is the uh, the gap in terms of methodologies that we use. I, when I started um, maybe 10 years ago, I was not exposed to participatory methods, so I was kind of doing my work using traditional interviews. But of late, um, I've, I've really had an interest on using participatory methods, especially working with young people. I think there's a lot that we could learn from, the, from those methods. I think uh, they help young people to be critical thinkers. They also create a space for dialogue with the people that you're working with. And also I think they help young people become agents of change because now you create a space for them to act on what they believe matters to them. And um, I think there's, there's something that can be done there in relation to the work that we do as researchers. That's good. And then coming back to your work, mm -hmm. is there any specific theory or perspective mm -hmm. that influence your writing? Certainly, yeah. <laughs> I am um, a capability approach proponent, um, particularly because I think uh, it resonates with the daily life that, that we live. If you think of the life, you waking up in the morning, coming here, you know, the process of just being here, uh, the CA speaks to that, right? So it speaks about the freedoms that people have as individuals or as groups to live the lives that they have risen to value. So I really like that uh, approach because it's very practical. Um, it's lived, you know, and it also speaks around the issues of agency. And, and I do believe, for me, each person is an agent in, in different ways. We do take certain action for us um, to realize things that matter to us. And also, um, I do uh, use uh, other theories. I, I use the theory of uh, Iris Marion Young around the five faces of oppression uh, when it comes to social justice. Because again, I really love to use theories that are very much more practical to the everyday life that we live. Wow, thank you so much, Doctor. And then, what message can you share with aspiring researchers? Uh, research. It's, it's, um, I guess it would be something to do with uh, aspiring researchers, right? Yes. Research is it's an interesting thing. It's, um, it's very, very much fulfilling. Certainly for me it has been. I guess I would have to speak from my own personal experiences, right? That for me research has been fulfilling and uh, particularly because um, it's, it's related to my own personal experiences. Then the research gives me the space to explore the solutions to the things that matter to me. And also, I, I guess it has to do with the passion 
uh, you've got to be passionate with what you're doing because passion will take you through difficult times and I think passion for me, people who are passionate are often people who are resilient because um, there are a lot of things that um, could go wrong when you're, when you're doing research, you work with different people, you have to apply for funding. Uh, so if you're not passionate, you could uh, easily give up. <laughs> and also I think um, you should never doubt your abilities as, as a researcher. I guess it's, uh, I've been privileged obviously because I've had a very supportive mentor and uh, my center where I come from, very supportive, but it's, um, it's not the norm. I, I know that we could be outliers who people get this kind of support and resources, but I would say to, to people who might not necessarily have this kind of uh, um, environmental support, not to doubt your abilities. Really um, network with the people around you. You know, you never know, you might meet people with resources, people with the knowledge that could help you. And also uh, go for conferences if you've got the opportunity. Uh, talk to people who are working around the same issues as you are, people with the same interest. And also um, just knowing that if, you know, the aim, I guess, of the work that we do is to see change for the positive. Also realizing that you can't do it alone. That, that's a fact and uh, sometimes we get uh, so drawn into our own personal work and then we forget that uh, you can't really be a tree without a forest, you know what I mean? And this is yes. something that one of the researchers uh, in, in a past project said that, you know, you can't be a tree without a forest. So you have to be among others to see the change that you want to see, uh, learn from the people that have been ahead of the game before you you know, climb on the soldiers of giants, you know, respect people's work because they're people who have done work before you. So learn from that work and then see how you can take the world going forward, I guess. Yeah, that's what I could say. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you so much. So collaboration plays a key role here. Key role, key role. That's, um, I, I believe it doesn't matter whether it's in research or not in research. I believe that you can't do anything on your own. You definitely need to, to work with somebody or other people. Yeah. Thank you. And then, Doctor, apart from research, mm -hmm. what are your other interests? I am interested in a lot of things. <laughs> I am interested in a lot of things, to be honest. Um, I guess I'll start with something that's related to, to my research. I am interested in the development of African early careers, um, career researchers. Uh, for example, again, most of the stuff that I research on um, is very personal to me sometimes. So um, in 20, I think in 2017 or 2018, I met colleagues at an international conference, uh, young black women, and I think it was the three of us, the whole conference, you know. And so we're curious, what is the problem? What is the issue? Why is it only the three of us here, where are our peers, where are others? So from that experience, um, I, I think for me that was the where the fire ignited in terms of this passion. Um, so we left that conference thinking uh, it's possible that people are not exposed to the kind of environments that we're exposed to. It's possible that others don't have resources to the, like, the same way we have resources. So we're like, but what can we do? How can we support? Um, our peers. So we started a, a network with uh, two of my uh, colleagues. It's called the African Early Career Researchers Network in Education. So what we try to do is we try to bring together early career researchers in Africa, support them whichever way they need support. It could be capacity building like uh, abstract writing, conference abstract writing for example. It could be um, how to publish in a journal right or how to write a book proposal you know so we're really interested in building capacity among our researchers in Africa and also trying to encourage peer-to-peer -peer, peer mentorship you know learning from each other and also just ampli amplifying the work that um, researchers on the continent are doing and this is something that also my uh, the center that I come from you know um, is really interested in, in pushing forward, so we're busy working around that. That's a passion for me. 
um, definitely. And then other passions that are not necessarily related to my work, I, I, love, I love farming. Yeah, that's a, that's a hobby of mine. I'm definitely interested in um, animal breeding. That is the stuff that I do outside my work. I, uh, I love, um, I, I run. So I'm passionate about, you know, creating apparel that I use. And again, this, this hobby started when, in high school, I used to enjoy fashion designing. Okay. But unfortunately, I didn't pass. So uh, I was sad that I didn't pass, but I said it's not something that I would give up doing. So I continued practicing uh, sewing and designing until um, about five, four years ago when I decided I think I'm just going to start making apparel for myself. So I do that as a hobby again, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's stuff that's interesting. I guess for me, I really love being creative in creative spaces. If I see a problem, automatically I think about what could I do, what's the solution, you know. So I love being creative and innovative in the little ways that I can. <laughs> yeah. Wow. That's so inspiring. <laughs> Thank you so much, Doctor. And then we've learned that you are not only an academic, but you are also lending a hand out there. Mm -hmm. That is inspiring. Thank you. Yes. And Doctor, lastly, one thing that we are ignoring mm -hmm. is mental health. Mm -hmm. So how can we tap in and mm -hmm. make people aware that mental health is crucial to our lives? I think, um, I think for me, um, it has to start from like the grassroots. It's, it's not something that necessarily, yes, in the university space, it's great that we've got um, people who are actually raising the banner, raising the awareness of mental health issues. It's quite a pity and unfortunate that it has taken so long. And I think the reason why it has taken so long is that mental health issues have been demonized in society where we come from, right? They have not necessarily been uh, considered um, a health challenge, right? But they've been considered otherwise. I think uh, for me, it would be great if um, those, those awareness campaigns could go to communities where our grandparents live, where uh, other people are not exposed to this environment that we're exposed to, right? Could actually learn more about mental health issues. I think it's something that could be raised even in primary schools, secondary schools so that people start really acknowledging that there is a challenge when it comes to mental health and it's something that people can get help for, right? Um, yeah. I think universities, certainly universities, cannot do it alone in terms of addressing the issues that arise in relation to mental health. I think it has to be um, in collaboration with even outside forces. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you so much, Doctor, for sharing with us. We really value your time of having you on our list. Thank you so much. Oh. It's been amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks.